Welcome to the Burn Bootcamp Podcast. I'm your host, Morgan Klein, co-founder and CEO, along with my husband and company visionary, Devin Klein. And together with our amazing team, we are gonna help you push past your limits, not just physically in our gyms, but right here, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually on the Burn Bootcamp Podcast. Together, we will take on challenges and break through barriers to transform into the best possible version of ourselves. We are more than a gym. We are a community, your community. Let's Let's go, go, Burn Nation. Nation. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Burn Bootcamp Podcast. My name is Devin, and I am the co-founder and visionary, uh, trainer by heart, uh, entrepreneur by choice to spread our amazing mission that we have here at Burn Bootcamp. And I love nothing more than sitting down with a member. Today we have Lisa Sauce, who is uh, from the Lake Norman location. She's been a member about seven or eight months. Uh, Lisa, welcome to the show today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And we talked a little bit before we came on today about, about Lisa's goals, and I'll have her really articulate those goals. But focus meetings are all about one thing and one thing only, and that's, and that's gaining more confidence because when we do have more confidence in our lives, we're able to approach life's optical obstacles with less doubt and less fear, um, less hesitancy, and more certainty and more vigor and, and, and can change our approach to our, our, our day. And so that's what, that's what Burn is all about, is really using the workout to be that, that tool to show you who you are and what you're really made of. And we supplement that with focus meetings. So our trainers across Burn Nation will meet with our members and um, they're more frequent and, and, and shorter in time than they are here on the podcast. They're usually, well, at least you've done a couple that are 15 mm-hmm. minutes in the gym. Yep. Um, but we get to really sit down and expand uh, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, wherever we may go. And I don't uh, profess to have all the answers here or anything like that, but um, I also get to grow as a byproduct of having a conversation with uh, an amazing human being who is uh, out here putting in work for her family. So Lisa, I, I would love to hear your background and I would love to just get uh, your story in perspective for all of us and bring us up until you join Burn and what it's done for you so far, what you have overcome and what you hope to overcome with having this sit down. Yep. So um, before Burn, I was all, always fairly active. Um, I wasn't seeing the gains I was wanting to see. I was putting in a ton of work, but um, had a lot of unhealthy habits with eating and overconsumption um, that, you know, I was putting all this work in, just not really getting anywhere. Um, and then I took a chance on Burn, um, loved it. Historically, with group classes, I've gotten bored. Um, and then just before Burn, I thought it was just an all women's facility. And, um, you know, some certain things come with that at other facilities where it may not be as welcoming. It's as, not always that way. Is right. It? Yes. <laughs> um, so I was very, I knew about Burn, um, but I gave it a shot on a trial. Um, loved it. Loved the trainers. Um, I loved that the focus was form, lifting heavy, getting your protein, your water, like everything that I believe in in my core. Um, Still, I saw some gains, but it was still coming back to um, my unhealthy habits outside of the gym. Um, And then last September was really when I made a radical change in my life. I had some personal things um, happening and I just felt my life getting out of control. And I made a very significant change in my life to really just put myself first for the first time ever and really look at what I was doing to build my cup and to build myself up and had to make a lot of uncomfortable changes um, to get to where I am today. And so you really were pulled into burn and that helped kind of spark some momentum for you. It sounds like, and was there a realization that, Hey, there's, there's more to me. It sounds like you went on this journey to go find more of yourself. And there's, and you had this realization that there, there's more of me. What was that all about? Yeah. So I, um, you know, I, you know, historically I've struggled with anxiety 
um, haven't really had a great outlook on myself, you know, body image issues. Um, and I just got to the point where I was just tired of being tired and unhappy. And I just was like, you know, there's got to be a better way because obviously what I'm doing right now is not working. Um, and I just finally said to myself, like, you know, you have to make yourself a focus, whether that's physical, diet, mental health, whatever it is, and really carve out the life that you want. Um, I think a lot of us, like we, the way we talk to ourselves is so negative and you don't even realize you're doing it a lot of the time. So like breaking down kind of these unhealthy habits that are so ingrained in us was really my focus. And do you think that's where a lot of maybe the anxiety came from is, um, you know, it was that correlated with, with confidence and, and why do you think the anxiety site, it seems to be was crippling at some, at some point? Yeah. So I think, um, the anxiety came from just my, um, being uncomfortable in my own skin. Um, and I think that kind of, you know, spawned out in different ways, right? So, I, you know, overeating, you know, I'm a, very, I'm a very emotional eater. So if I'm, you know, feeling a certain way, it's going to come out in other unhealthy ways and just starting to become, become more in tuned on that, it has been helpful. When you say in tune, you've, that means you've been doing some work on figuring out, you know, why is this feeling of anxiety or the self-awareness process started to begin of why am I feeling this way? And what's the, what's the root cause? What did you find out? Yeah. A lot of it just came back to just my, um, just not feeling comfortable, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. in my own skin. And I think, what do you think that means, Lisa? Cause like, um, that, so that's the, just, I just noticed that's the second time you've, you've really said that. And, and earlier you mentioned, you know, some un, unhealthy eating habits and unhealthy habits out outside of the gym. Where, what's the underlying root cause to that feeling of not being comfortable in my own skin? Like you could also think about this question is how do I define not being comfortable in my own skin? What, what feelings do I have? What emotions, what experiences yep. were associated with that? Is there one or more experiences that you can zoom into where your anxiety was like, Oh, this is the moment where I've had enough too much, too much pain with this anxiety thing here. Can you tell us that story? Yeah. So I think it, it all comes down to just not feeling like you're good enough. Um, mm. And, you know, I'm my own worst enemy. So um, it could be at work. I do a presentation and everyone's like, you killed it. You did awesome. In my head, I don't see it that way. I'm nitpicking on, you know, oh, I started stuttering at this part and everyone thinks going to think I'm stupid. And, you know, just I'm, you know, I wasn't very kind to myself. And, um, I think that comes, at least for me personally, it comes from childhood. Um, so I kind of learned to kind of stay out of the shadows, I guess, but then I would cope in other ways, being uncomfortable, whether it be overeating or over drinking or other ways to kind of make that discomfort better. When you say, not feeling like you're good enough was that some imposition on you by somebody else was that a parent teacher mentor aunt uncle was that somebody like is the voice in your head of you know i'm stuttering people are gonna think i'm stupid mm -hmm. is that your voice or is that a voice of from somebody from your childhood that had that had shaped you and and, and put that there yeah so um i think for me something that was defined me as who I am in early elementary school I got picked on quite a bit and um I that kind of taught me to kind of stay quiet um don't be yourself um you know people are going to make fun of you They're how gonna, old were you when you were picked on the most do you think uh, probably fifth grade mm, those are those are the <laughs> moments I mean it doesn't it seem like it's, it's can seem so silly to us sometimes that this moment that we got picked on in fifth grade, this person that we were is still a part of who you are today. Yeah. And oftentimes it, the reconciliation of that fifth grader takes place 20 years later. Yep. And you you're know? still carrying on 
that, you know, learned behavior from it. Um, it so it's really not that you're silly and stuttering and the presentation was bad. People probably actually really mean that it was good, but you got this Lisa from fifth grade's voice on the playground <laughs> in your head saying, they're going to pick on me for sure. Right. Because they always have. Yeah. So therefore you start to manufacture what might what might not be real. Right. Doesn't seem to be real. Yeah. Have and you then, connected th these things before? Have you have you walked down memory lane and tried to bring some of these stories of the past up and reconcile with what they mean? Yeah, yeah. I think that's part of um, kind of my journey now is realizing like a lot of that comes from those experiences back then, and a lot of that kind of inner voice from those experience kind of sh you know shaped who I am today. You know, I may not. Um, put myself out there as much out of fear that, you know, they're going to think I'm this or I'm that. Um, a lot of it comes from really just people pleasing um, and trying to figure out why, you know, why do I care what someone could think? Um, and, and then deep down, you don't even know if that's the case, right? right. <laughs> you just like have this assumption of, this is going to happen, and then you just kind of tuck yourself into this box well, that's to kind of protect yourself. That's what anxiety is, right? It's the fear of what would happen in the future that hasn't happened yet. Right. right? Very irrational. Um, when you talk, you know, talk it out loud, like, I'm fearful of this, this, and this. Well, why? Well, none of that's there. And even if you tell yourself none of this has even happened yet, it's still, you know, it's still hard. What was your process to go back and reconcile with the fifth grade version of Lisa? Um, so I've dabbled in therapy. Um, I always, it's, <laughs> I always sometimes make excuses cause I'm like, I'm so busy. When am I, you know, to keep it up? So I've been trying to do journaling. That's been helpful. Um, just trying to find ways with my schedule to have though that time for me to reflect and to kind of just feel those feelings and be being more aware when it's happening has been helpful. Yeah. That self-awareness journey yep. of, of having that version of you, the non-judgmental version of you on your shoulder right. to have a conversation with. And that's been helpful. Yep. When you, when you think about, um, who back in the day, is there a person that comes to mind, a specific individual or was it maybe an experience, a specific ex experience? How specific can you get with that memory? This is, the, out of all the things that I think we can talk about, there's a reason that you brought that up here. Yeah. And when there's a finite m amount of time, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, bringing that up as an embossed negative memory in your past means a lot. Mm -hmm. And we have to reconcile with that completely before we can just say, oh yeah, I'm journaling, I'm moving on. No, no, no. Who was there? What was the situation? Like, how specific can you get for me on, on that experience, who that might have been, how that made you feel? And then have you said, have you had a conversation with that fifth-year-old version, five year, uh, fifth-grade version of yourself to say that, you know, Lisa, you don't have to think people are picking on you anymore. Yeah. You don't ha you have to you don't have to do that anymore. My yeah. mindset coach really helped me do that cuz I went th through some crazy things as a kid and so he helped me stop back and think of like the positive or negative memory in every single year mm -hmm. and and have like a reconciliation like a deep conversation via via letter. Mm -hmm. So answer the the question and then we'll we'll see. Yeah, what. there's definitely certain people that come to mind and ex experiences that come to mind. Um, a lot of what I was kind of picked on um, back at that time, I was overweight. Um, I had buck teeth. It was before I started coloring my hair. And then um, seventh, eighth grade came, I lost the weight, my braces came off, I started coloring my hair and it was like, now people were nicer to me. So I think that was a very defining moment for me because it kind of taught you how you look impacts how people treat you. Um, and I've, you know, I've unpacked that. I know there's like exercises you can do on like, what would you say to your, you know, your 
inner child when that's happening and, you know, stuff like that. But I can't say that didn't teach me a lot about how the world can be based on kind of how you look. Mm -hmm. And so now you have this kind of there's enough is enough moment with anxiety and you begin your journey almost as if there's an awakening that happened to the higher version of yourself. Do you feel like today that's stopping you right here, right now? Is this, uh, uh, you know, you're always going to have a relationship mm -hmm. and it's always going to be part of you in the past. Is it a part of this version of you that sits here today or is this a part of the past versions of you? It's still here. I still have work to do. I think big part of what made me finally this, there's a multitude of reasons of why I went on this journey, but a huge part of it is, you know, now I have daughters that I'm raising. And if I don't have a better image on my body issues, are they going to have the same issues that I have? And that, you know, that really puts things into perspective. Um, you know, it's, I think as parents, even though we try not to, a lot of our stuff falls to them. And, you know, I'd, I'd hate for my girls to grow up and then something that I did because I was still trying to figure out my stuff poured on to them. Mm -hmm. And what tools are you using right now to make sure that that doesn't happen? You said journaling is one of them. How's that going? It's going good. Um, it's still finding the time, you know, with two toddlers running around. Um, but something that I've learned, um, I used to think when it came down to mental health, I, I thought it was like, oh, once I get my mental health fixed, I'm good. Like, you know, I'm confident now. I don't have to work at this anymore. Um, I've come to the conclusion it's very much like your physical health. You know, if I have a PR in the gym or if I'm trying to build my muscle, let's say I hit that and I just stop, it's going to go right back down. I've learned that's the same thing with mental health. You have to continually prioritize it or you're going to find yourself back, you know, taking steps backwards. Yeah. Yeah. There is a continual prioritization of your body. Mm-hmm your emotional health, your mental health, your spiritual health, their, your relational health, your the health of your work environment, the health of your finances, the health, the health of your purpose in life and the relationship you have with that. I mean, there's, there's a lot that we're responsible for. There's yeah. a lot of room for anxiety to, to, to creep in. And one thing that is important to me uh, as I experience share here is that I have in those eight kind of areas I just described that there's one ritual that is on a piece of paper for my body, right? We know that's camp because <laughs> yeah. we can't, that's what we do. Yeah. Right. Number two, mental health. If not, you know, this is no specific order, but what are we doing every day? Mm -hmm. Right. What are we actually doing? And, and if it's that important to you, right. Then if it's, if it's whether or not your daughters grow up, with a crippling anxiety or not, if that's what you place on it, mm -hmm. right, then it couldn't be ignored because of a perceived absence of time. Right. Right. It would be at this place where it's, hey, I do this every day because if I don't, here's the consequence. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, I don't know if you've ever discussed this in, 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 your, in your journey, but oftentimes the pain of something is, is we call it the, uh, the push motivation. Mm -hmm. What's pushing you from behind? What's that? What's the pain that you don't want to feel? Yep. Right. Cause that can be just as motivating as some enchanting version of the future that you want. So, you know, what do you want? This is a question for you. What are you running away from? What do you, what do you refuse to have as an outcome in your life? Right. I think that has something to do with what you've already started explaining with your family and what is that vision that's pulling you forward? What's the push motivation? What's the pull motivation? Yeah, there's a, actually a quote I saw a couple of weeks ago and it said, it's like the magic that you're looking for is in the work that you're pushing off or something like that. And that really resonated to me because it, you know, we're all, cap you know, we all do this, but anytime something gets uncomfortable, we're gonna tuck it away and 
put it on, you know, for another day. But um, it's really just pushing yourself forward and feeling that um, that discomfort to hopefully, you know, get in a better spot. Okay, so journaling mm -hmm. and the goal is to be more consistent with that. Yep. Right. And the underlying way to do that is to draw a purpose toward it that's that requires you to re refuse to miss it. Mm -hmm. Like I will I will not miss doing this because there's if if I miss then it's kind of an if then statement. If I miss it then this happens. Yep. And that's always been really helpful for me. But not to just think about this is the difference, right? Like it's there's thinking, writing, feeling. So you can think that thought easy and that can be right here right now and it can resonate and then it can go out the other it can go out the other ear right so writing down is the next level of permanency so you're writing it down and i go to speak to groups and i ask people like if they could show me what goals they have in their life and, and what's stopping them from getting there and like out of a thousand people like five people will raise their hand like less than one percent like mm -hmm. will raise their hand actually show me because the caveat is if you raise your hand i'm going to pull you up on stage and i'm gonna <laughs> you're gonna have to read it to everybody yeah. so don't lie to me right and almost no one almost no one does it so it's like a lot of people know it but knowledge isn't power it's only potential power um napoleon hill said that in think and grow rich and then you have to go down to the writing layer where i take my thoughts i make them permanent on paper mm -hmm. but the last layer is where all the magic happens and i'm sure you've you've ran into this before where you take the thought, you write it down, but then you feel how the thought manifests in emotion if it's already done, if it's already here. And that's where meditation comes in for me. It's, it's a, there's an outcome to it to say, to, to try to be present as I possibly can and to feel the emotion of gratitude for the thing in my life that is there that I haven't yet physically manifested or the gratitude that I currently feel from being the person that is running away from the thing that I am trying to run from. Mm -hmm. So when you think of those three layers, have you ever thought about it like that? Um, and are you driving, are you driving your journaling like into your body, into your central nervous system by not just thinking it, not just writing it, but by feeling it? Yeah, I could definitely do better <laughs> at it. Um, so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll journal and I do these prompts that help with just like, um, what is it called? It's a type of cognitive behavioral therapy. It's just basically just almost like what you're talking about, like feeling things and just letting yourself feel it, experience it and not tuck it away. Um, the, and I don't, not to make excuses, but typically that's the, that's the first thing that's going to get knocked off my to-do list when you get busy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm trying to be more strict on like, this has to happen. Um, so that's, is that, that is one of my goals is to like, this is important. Let's not push this off. Let's not wait, you know, months from now. And, you know, I haven't done any progress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now talk a little bit about the, uh, those other areas that surround the, the mind and, and the body. Um, how, how, is, how is your relationship today with yourself when it comes to the anxiety? What is, you know, I, I'd be careful when I say those words because a lot of times we'll often like diagnose ourselves with something called anxiety when really it's just you're worrying about things in the future that 99.9999999999% repeating will not happen. Right. And so if you're going to worry about it, like, you know, it's kind of logical to just worry about it when it happens rather than now easy to be set, easy to say that. Mm -hmm. Right. But then it's harder to unwind, you know, this childhood anxiety um, that you've had. So what is that relationship that, you know, connection with yourself like today? Yeah, it's getting better. Um, when I first started this journey, I becoming more mindful of when I'm being mean to myself internally, I was like, this is never going to get better. Like I, you know, I feel like I'm attacking myself. Why, why is my brain just, you know, I'll shut one thought down and here comes another one out of left field. And it felt like on overdrive. And I think for me, it was, um, it was really that self-talk and stopping yourself when you start to have these negative thoughts. Um, I had to check myself 
a month or so ago, I did a in body weigh in and my muscle mass had not increased, you know, to where I wanted it to be. And I, at, at first I had this thought, you know, when I get to this, I'll finally feel comfortable with myself. And I kind of had to stop myself and, you know, what are you talking about? You know, this body created two human beings. This body allows you to get up every day and pick up your kids and go to work and work out. You know, a lot of people don't have that. They, they don't have that. Mm -hmm. So like really being grateful with what you have has been helpful. I think a lot of times we focus on what we don't have. And that's when we get into these um, negative thoughts and feelings. But it's stopping yourself in that moment and kind of redirecting those thoughts has been helpful. It's still very hard because, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, you know, your mind's a very powerful thing. Um, but from what I'm learning, the more and more I can stop myself, redirect, and then kind of be grateful for what I do have has been, I'm starting to see the positive um, benefits of that. The yogis call what you're describing the great gap, <laughs> right? From, you know, we have this, you even bake it in what I'm about to say into the word itself, into the definition itself. We're programmed to say self-talk and there's a sense of ownership with the word self. There's a sense of identification, identification with the word I or self or me as if those thoughts that you're thinking are owned by you and solely you, your self-talk, you are talking to yourself. When in reality, the ego is making it seem like it's self-talk, but at the end of the day, these are this is universal talk. This is the collective unconscious of eons of human thought, right? That are baked inside of you. Like mm -hmm. this, you are you are born with this propensity to have, and nobody knows why. You were born with this propensity to have pot, thoughts come into your head from out of nowhere, and they're and they're positive or negative, but making the assumption that it's our thoughts is. It, is, it will allow you to be, if it's your thoughts and you're attached to it, you own it. But the whole goal for me in this and why I enjoy yoga and meditating and more mindful present things is because I can have thoughts and detach myself from them, mm -hmm. right? You're completely disassociated from the thought that you're thinking and you actually almost apply um, uh, like a sense of an obser observation to it. Like it's a movie coming in. Like, oh, look at that silly negative thought over there. Like that must have <laughs> like, been that's some... that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool thought over there. That's like, but but you're not grabbing onto it, boom, and then taking it and like bringing it in and owning it. Because as soon as you believe it, you'll start to feel it. Yep. And as soon as you feel it, you own it. Right. Right. And so this, is, this has been my process of yoga is to, the yogis, like I said, call it the great gap. And all they're saying is, before you think the thoughts that are in your head are your thoughts, have a gap, take a breath. Let there be a giant canyon that's between the thought that comes in and then the actual expression of that thought, whether it be um, verbally or, or, or emotionally. And for me, that has been one of the most helpful, just like, pieces of knowledge just, not even knowledge in a sense but it's just that way you can structure what's happening the language that you can apply to like oh now I don't have to worry about this wrestle of like telling myself talk nicer to yourself like yeah try to will your way into talking nicer to yourself that's never going to happen it's the underlying root cause of the problem is that we're attaching ourselves to these thoughts that don't belong to us in the first place um have you have you had a bit of this experience is this what you're talking about um somewhat i think uh a lot of it for me is also learning um the human brain we're wired to look for the negative that's all survival um and so you have to train yourself to really find you know the good the what you're grateful for you have to very you know very much make that a part of your everyday life and i know it's not it's not easy like i can't i'm not going to sit here and say everything's just rainbows and butterflies and once you start talking nicer to yourself everything's perfect because it is work that you have to do um but i think for me realizing that it it's all just part of your brain chemistry on why 
certain things come in. And then, like you said, if you can stop yourself and just realizing what's happening has, even though maybe there is some like validity to this negative thought, right? But just realizing and being present that it's happening has been helpful. Good. And yeah. are you on a daily basis aware of this? Um, or how, how good are you? How good are you getting at applying the gap or what you're really saying? Like when people say mindfulness, mm -hmm. all they're talking about is the gap. All they're talking about is that quick contemplation of, wait a second, is this really me talking? Like on a daily basis, do you feel like you're filtering consciously? Um, I'm getting better. Okay, good. Yeah. Progress. Yeah. And does that progress make, make happiness? Does that create happiness? Do you feel fulfilled with progressing in that way? I don't know if it's happiness, but it's content. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the, there's another, I don't know if you heard Mel Robbins. Mm -hmm. She has what's called the let them theory. Um, and basically, you know, let's say at work you don't get picked to, I don't know, take on this really big project. And it's just, you know, when things like that happen, just let them. And you're almost just letting them pass you by. Similar to what you were talking about, here's a thought. I'm, I'm not going to accept that thought, but mm -hmm. it, it's there. Mm -hmm. um, and that has also been helpful to stop myself and not let the hysteria, I guess you could say, um, happen when you have these thoughts or things, you know, things that happen in your life. I struggle with this too. And we're all on, a, on this journey together. And um, so the first real like coach that I ever hired was about eight months ago, um, 12 months ago, maybe. And his name is uh, uh, Derek Grant, DG. Known him for a long time and really sat back and, and looked at what he was doing and finally, finally jumped in and I said, hey, I think you could really, I think you could really help me here. Um, and one of the things that he had me do uh, right away was go back to my parents and write a letter to my mom, write a letter to my dad, write a letter to myself from the perspective of who I am now to who I was then. Mm -hmm. And the reason he had me do that is because of what Mel Robbins talks about. What we're all really talking about here is um, at the, at the punchline is controlling the outcome or trying to control the outcome is, is always going to produce frustration, fear, shame, doubt, guilt, lower energy emotion. Mm -hmm. And part of writing to yourself in my case, it was my parents. In your case, it might be we didn't get to the specific person that I know is in your head who picked <laughs> on you that you don't have to say out loud, but it's that person. That's the person you have to write and forgive if anxiety ever dissipates and goes all the way away because it's so much, it's so rooted on layers and layers and layers of that happening. And then other little instances, but if the other instances were big enough, you would have talked about those. You didn't. You talked about this one. Yeah. And so writing back for me, was that way to ultimately let go of mm -hmm. control of the outcome. And I have to tell you, my life has gotten so much more content, so much more peace, mm -hmm. so much more happiness as a byproduct. Not that I always expect to be happy, but there's a lot more happiness because I don't have any fear or frustration. No out external circumstance has the power to make me frustrated anymore or make me fearful. This is what Mel Robbins is yep. saying is because the outcome doesn't matter. Right. You it, got that power back. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. And I, and I love that you're working on that. And so you're going to keep progressing in that. And so I guess my next question is what's, what's, what's the other side of it? What are you running toward? Um, do you have a specific picture or, or, or vision? You know, we all need a blueprint. We all need something that in which we can that we can say, hey, I'm doing in, I'm doing good in alignment with where I said I was going to be, right? Or, yeah, I, or I'm not. Yeah. So like, um, the journey I'm on right now, it's so hard to measure, right? Because it's not um, having a better outlook on life and better self worth, confidence. You can't really measure that. Um, so I would say my uh, 
future goal is just continue to pour into myself to be the best version of me, whatever that looks like, right? Um, and knowing that, you know, I may not have, you know, I'm not perfect and being okay with that. I know that's a very vague answer, um, but it's very hard to put kind of this journey on a, oh, I'm here, I'm, I've figured it all out because mm -hmm. I feel like it's going, to, it's going to be a constant mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. exploration. Yeah. I, it will be, it will be, but even in, even, even without in exploration, you still have to have a direction. Humans will actually walk naturally in a circle. If you let them, if you just let somebody loose in the woods, they're going to think they're navigating their way away from the woods, but they're just going to end up right back where they started. And so, although there doesn't need to be a definition per se, I think it's useful, at least in my observation to have a blueprint of how things might look if I was to become the person who I'm destined to be through my self actualization, what in this physical plane of the world, what manifests, what, and it, and it can be whatever you want, but I know when it's the right answer and you'll know when it's the right answer. Cause it will be everything in your life that you love. Mm -hmm. It'll be spending a day with who you love, where you love spending it, how you love spending it. And, um, we call this the, the North star when I teach people. And it's, it's just a directional conversation. Are we going north? Are we going south? Are we going east? Are we going west? So that you have, so that you don't end up walking in the human circle on a self actualization journey. That's mis that's not guided by something that, that used an energy or, or not necessarily an outcome. It's just an energy that you put forward. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example. Cause I know sometimes the esoteric stuff is hard to, even for, um, you know, most, even, even for people that talk about it, it's hard to grasp in burn boot camp, I say, guys, we're going to 10,000 locations. Do I think we're going to go to 10,000 locations? Maybe, I don't know. I have no idea how to define that or what it looks like, but I do know what to do today. If we were going to 10,000 versus if we were going to 500 and we already made it, if we we're going to 500, the work's done. We're here. Yeah. Right. But if we're going to some vision of the future where, um, it's a, it's not unattainable, but it's undefinable. You don't really know how you're going to get there. You just know that that's the direction I'm going in. And I teach people to write out what that day might look like, right? Who would you be with? What would you be wearing? As if you had to live this day over and over and over and over and over and over and over on repeat. Mm -hmm. Cause you're really going to only spend the you're really going to only spend time with the people that you love and doing the things you love if you got to live the same day over and over. So it's not necessarily like, where are you going to end up? Mm -hmm. It's saying what lifestyle gives me the most content possible, gives me the most peace so that I can give the most energy I can back, back to others. Does that make sense? It's a little more esoteric than the classic, like set a goal for 20 yeah. years and like put a number on it. What's your net worth? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's a, um, good way to think about it. Cause I've always on this journey of, you know, really just finding peace. It's like, how do you measure that? Right? Like, um, there's nothing really tangible that you can put on paper and say, Oh, I, I, I'm check that off my list. I did it. Um, but tying it back to the lifestyle on, you know, when I think of what, what I want, I think that can help me at least kind of set some goals, even though, you know, it, it is kind of a untangible thing. Even, if, even if it's a direction, cause then your let's say your kids ask you, um, what do we stand for as a family? You want to be able to answer that. What are our core values as a family? And I'm sure you guys have these in your head, in your actions, but part of that is the story. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how do I want my kids to behave on this random day, 20 years from now where I've, I don't think you could say the word mastered, but I am the most elevated 
version of myself I could possibly be. I've put work in on my mind, my body, my emotions, my spirit, my relationships. I spend my time wisely. I talk to myself lovingly. I work in an environment in which I can control the energies around me. And because of that, my financial future is, or my financial situation is one I'm at peace with, peace mm -hmm. with. And that could mean a hundred dollars. That could mean zero dollars. It could mean a, it, but it's part of the world that we live in today. And, and I think, um, I think it could only help you to start uh, putting together what that direction could look like as a way to, for when people in the family ask, say, okay, you know, it's that direction, mm -hmm. you know, it's toward, it's toward, um, higher character. It's toward leadership. It's toward loving more people. It's toward, you know, okay. So those are ways to make it tangible is to reverse yeah. engineer it into the core values that you want to have as a family. And then, you know, mine's a story. I have this crazy story. I, I don't, I won't, I won't tell the whole thing cause this is your time, but, um, it's a crazy story of what, if all the intentions that I set forth in my life were to manifest, great, this is what would happen. But there's no anxiety or worry or fear if it if it doesn't, mm -hmm. because I know that I can control the present moment. And if I can control the present moment, I'm gonna get to where I'm going regardless if the energy is out there. And and uh, I've got a directional conversation. So yeah, anything there to you ring a bell or anything that is interesting? Um. Um, what you said on, you know, I'm confident in what I can control. I think, um, that's also been kind of a huge part because it's almost like you take your power back. Um, cause it doesn't, there's going to be so many things in life that happen that you can't control, but I know that no matter what has happened in my life, I am the driver. So it's almost like, um, part of what I've had to go through this, um, past year is just like, um, I don't want to so I, I tell myself, don't play victim. And I don't mean that to be a bad thing. Like, I think that term can be used in a context where someone's milking a situation and trying to get something out of it. But I mean that, and you can be upset with how things are, or you can let that define you and move you forward. Um, so I would hold on to a lot of resentment of just things that have happened in my life. And it's like, don't let yourself be a victim. You're not a victim. This is where you're at. What are you going to do about it? Do those moments, are those, are those moments like clear to you? Yeah. Um, so my mom passed away and from cancer and then, uh, my dad, he has Alzheimer's and I'm an only child. So, um, that situation has been very hard for me, especially becoming a mom myself and not having your, you know, a family. Um, and I would get very upset and very resentful, you know, seeing my friends that had these big support systems around and, you know, everything's really just on me and my husband. Um, and I would get let, I would let that fester and I would get upset by it. And it's like, you know, this is, this is the hand that you've been dealt. You can either push yourself through it or you can let yourself, you know, be upset, be sad, but that's not helping you. Um, so I've had to kind of stop myself a lot of the time and just, you know, this is the situation. What can you do to make it better? Where did you find your bitterness was pointed? Um, just, I, I guess, was uh, it at them specifically, was it at yourself at Bitterness is associated with something. What was it associated with? Um, I don't know if it's just seeing um, my friends and coworkers, mm. how they, um, like if they needed a break, you know, they have their in-laws or they just have that support system. It's not really just having someone to watch your kids when you feel like you need a break, but it's just that support Um and I would just be so resentful because mm -hmm. it's like, so, you know, sometimes I feel like it's all on, you know, we don't, we don't have that. Um, and I would let that, you know, upset me uh, and think about how things could be different. Like if, you know, my parents were, uh, you know, alive or, you know, healthy, how, you know, my life would be so different. 
you know, and then, you know, thinking about the impact on my children, like it, it's a lot of heavy feelings um, that can take you down a path if you don't stop it. Because like me getting that bitterness and resentfulness of what I don't have is not elevating me to the, you know, to what I'm capable of. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I had a period of time where I had such a resentment toward my mom and dad. And the antidote for me was forgiveness and gratitude and almost flipping those emotions, those emotions, it's important to, it was important for me to identify where the bitterness was coming from, mm -hmm. the person. No, it couldn't be coworkers, that it couldn't be my friends. There's specific people that you saw them on Facebook and you're like, oh, I'm so angry and bitter at you for be having your family around and you're just, <laughs> I can see you and I like you, but I hate you right now, <laughs> right? And, yeah. And we don't have to say who it is, but the process of healing for me was in identifying who the bitterness was associated or the resentment was associated with and then writing letters physically, going back to thinking, writing, feeling. And I would write to them how they made me feel. <laughs> I would write to them how much of a bastard they were. Mm -hmm. I would write to them. I would just get all the things out on paper that I thought and then I said I was wrong because what you taught me was so much more important than what you did. What you did give me was so much more important than what you didn't give me. <laughs> and what you didn't give me is also being used to make me a better person, to go on this journey of self-awareness, to identify, to get to know myself better, to you showed me where bitterness can come into my life and corrode my very fabric of being and happiness. And I thank you for that. And I forgive you for that. And that to me was maybe something that, um, that you would consider doing for all of those times in life, the five to six times throughout your history, mm -hmm. those times that are so silly and insignificant to other people, but mean a lot to you. Yeah. The fifth grader that mm -hmm. was the one picking on you the most, that yeah. this person that you saw when you had your, those feelings of resentment and man, there's nothing, there's no, like, again, you go back to, like, you said a couple times, like giving my power up, like I'm done doing that. This is the actual tangible process to do that. You know yeah. What I mean? Yeah. I'll definitely try that. Cause I, you know, you hear that quote and it's like holding on to anger. What is it? It's like what giving them poison and expect, or, um, there's a quote that's basically, it means you holding on to this resentful and anger is only hurting you. You're not hurting this. Earth. This other person has no idea. Um, maybe they do, but you're not, <laughs> you know, it's really festering internally and it's preventing you. And forgiveness is really about you. It's not about the other person, but you know, it's so hard <laughs> yeah. when you're in it. Cause you're like, no, like they've wronged me or they, you know, they did this. They don't deserve forgiveness, but it's really about you. But um, having exercises, like you mentioned, I think would be helpful for me. Because even though I'm, you know, I'm on this journey and, you know, things are getting better. But um, sometimes you do go back to that anger of like um, things that have happened. And it would be nice to be freed from all of it. Cause it's only hurting me. It's not that person has no idea that they live rent free in my head. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I mean, that might be, that might be because we don't really know where memory comes from or why we have it, but that might be a plausible answer so that you can go back when you are a fully formed functioning brain as an adult and you can go back and you can reconcile with the experiences that you had that shaped who you are. Mm -hmm. And I think in this process, what I found is also that there was a large removal of ego because if you had, so if you, if we're made of three things really, right, we're made of an ego, which wants to care about material, who we are, how other people think about us, emotions, fears, there's the consciousness, pure energy, Mm -hmm. Right. Nobody knows what that is, but it's not associated to the self. The ego is I, the ego is me, the ego is self. And then there's the collective unconsciousness of the thoughts that come in that we don't have control over. Right. So the ego 
the ego wants to come in and take those thoughts and identify them with ways that you see yourself for your blueprint. And that's a powerful force. The consciousness is the, uh, the contemplation side where I come in and I actually think about, use my mental faculties to think about what this actually means. And so all the things that we're talking about is just a bunch of different ways to go back to use your memory, at least to partly for what it's for, to reconcile and to say, hey, when I was 12, my, I didn't know what an ego even was, but this was my ego that told me I was this way. And I've never challenged the consciousness, the original thought process has never challenged it after that. And so therefore, I thought then I am now because there had been no further contemplation. And that to me, when you say like, I'm on the journey, it's just a journey of it's removal of ego. Mm -hmm. Right. And we all have one yeah. and it's going to continue to creep up, but it's can, how can you be more conscious? How can you expand your consciousness around the relationship with yourself, the relationship with your spouse and your family and your mm -hmm. kids, the relationship with your greater family and your friends. And ultimately it, you get really good at those things, right? Then we can start to be impactful for our city and our schools and our government or our state or our region or our country even, you know, and, and, you know, to me, that's, that's the journey. Mm -hmm. Self-actualization. That's the journey that we're all on. Yeah. So maybe doing some of those exercises, writing those letters, it might be painful. I cried <laughs> Yeah, on all three of them. That's interesting. All I mean, three. Yeah. And I told myself, I'm not going to cry, <laughs> but you start to feel it and you cry. I mean, that's the emotion. Emotion creates motion. Yeah. Right. That motions that that's energy and you're getting those that's weight lifted off of you. Yeah. That you've all thought about, but never put down, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to explore that. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're here. Um, let's, 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 let's assume that, you know, one of your things you'll go, you'll go away and do is you'll dig deeper into taking thoughts, making them permanent and then putting, and then associating feeling to them, mm -hmm. maybe through writing letters to mm -hmm. the people in your life who the ego had perceived done you wrong yes. in the past. <laughs> um, so, and that will be, I mean, we could stop right now and that would be, uh, I think profound, uh, and really great for you to explore. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that we got everything that y you came for that you wanted to talk about today. Um, what haven't we, what haven't we really covered? What questions do you have or notions that you have or topics that you maybe wanted to discuss that, that we didn't? Um, I guess the only other thing that's really been impactful for me, especially within the last year is, um, I gave up my relationship with alcohol okay. in September. Congratulations. Um, complete. 180 from how my life used to be. Um, and it's crazy how, um, I didn't realize how much it was bringing me down. Um, it, it, my, you know, before, you know, so many things are centered around alcohol. Like you really don't realize it. Um, and then going on this journey, it's like, you know, normally we would do this. <laughs> what are we doing now? Um, it's, it's wild of all the kind of things you start to notice, um, that were just second, second nature before. Um, so that's been honestly one of the most helpful things for me as I've gone through kind of this mental health, confidence, self-worth exploration is just getting rid of alcohol for my life. And was it becoming a problem for you? Was it increasing your feelings of anxiety? Yes. Mm -hmm. 1000%. Mm -hmm. Um, especially with what, um, what I went through the last year with, you know, my dad has Alzheimer's things got very crazy. Um, and I used alcohol to cope with my feelings, with my stress. Um, and I felt like I was at a point where it's either I can go one way in my life or I can go another. And I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> um, but it, it came to a point where it was like, I have to change. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so you're having suicidal thoughts or was it not? Su- uh, I wouldn't say depressive, s- just depressive thoughts. Yeah. Um, and I just felt like it was, a. it was becoming a cycle. It was a binge few days where I don't feel great. Ben, like it was just, you know, it was becoming just a, a pattern mm. of not feeling great. And then when you don't feel great, I would drink to feel good. And then it, back, you know, just, it's like a, you know, a wheel just going on and on. And it was never helping me get, you know, my problems figured out. Um, even though in the moment you, you think it is, you're like, oh, stressful week at work. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> and it wasn't actually like helping me. Um, and I can say now I feel so much better. Um, cause even for me, like if you go out and have a few drinks, like I would feel it the next day, I would feel sluggish. I would feel not a hundred percent. I would make not healthy food choices. Mm-hmm. Then I would have shame in those food choices. And it was just, it was holding me back. Mm. Um, and so that has been a huge shift in my life. That's amazing. Yeah. I know how difficult that is um, to be around <laughs> environments and you're the one that's the odd person out and not drinking. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, especially with my, I'm in tech. The, uh, networking is probably the hardest thing yes. to do um, sober. Yes. Um, cause you know, everyone's like, can I get you a drink? I'm like, no, I'm okay. And there's this weird silence, like what's wrong with her, you know? And I'm like, I'm really fine. Um, but I, you know, it's kind of helping me getting comfortable in my own skin, Mm. which that before I would lean on alcohol and I felt discomfort. Mm. So I feel like it's kind of accelerated my growth. It was blocking your process yeah. of self actualization <laughs> of finding out who you really are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's removed and you must feel a uh, huge weight lifted off your shoulders even, even yeah. though it was hard, right? Yeah, um, for sure. Even, it's still uncomfortable at times because um, I feel like you don't really notice it now, but especially in our society, when we celebrate we drink when we've had a bad week we drink when the kids are stressing you out you drink it's like all no. roads point to alcohol yeah and, yeah and um now it's trying to figure out okay so what do we do when we feel these feelings um and it's it's still a, a work in progress um but i can say that's probably one of the most helpful things that mm. it has done for me um, that's awesome congratulations yeah. thank you yeah i'm, I'm uh I'm uh, on my own journey as well, um, and I, I have I couldn't say that I completely quit, mm-hmm. but it's been very, very, very infrequent, mm-hmm. and it's been it's been uh, I'm glad to have somebody else on the <laughs> yeah as the awkward one at the party yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um. But you know you get to know yourself better, mm-hmm. and you've probably got much more clarity. What is that clarity? How is so for everybody listening, how is the clarity that is manifest from the decision to stop drinking, mm-hmm. how has that impacted your life in a, in a positive way from all those buckets that we talked about, family, body, mind? Just talk to me through why somebody would be sitting there today being like, mm, alcohol is awesome because it is, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? To a certain extent, like mm-hmm. you have a lot of fun when you're doing it, right? And until it isn't. Right. Right. What, what, w- what would you say to persuade somebody or, or get them thinking about, you know, the grass being greener on the other side? Yeah. Um, f- for me, it's just the impact on my mental health um, has been a game changer. Also, my body. I, you know, for me, I would have a couple drinks and then I'd want unhealthy foods. And then you wake up the next day. You don't want to eat clean. You don't want to eat. Um, you know, what, like you should be eating, you want that greasy food. So it was all impacting my physical, uh, my body, my mind. Um, and I don't think I would be here today working on my mental health if I was still stuck in the same ways Mm -hmm. of over consuming and leaning on that to help me through those uncomfortable moments. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here right now. 
Yeah, because it what dilutes the intensity of the problem at hand. Right. You could drink, <laughs> and it actually makes it feel better in the moment. Right. Yeah, and it never feels better in the long run, does it? No. Yeah. Well, that is that is amazing, and I'm and I'm proud of you for that. And you know, your journey uh, uh, from joining Lake Norman eight months ago to having an awakening. Uh, part of that sounds like in a large way, it was. Um, anxiety was building and alcohol was a big part of it and stopping that really set you on a the new level and there's going to continue to be levels and I have levels and we all have levels mm -hmm. as we try to find out who we really are and um, I'm proud of you thank you yeah you've been work clearly working really really hard on it yeah but work's not done no <laughs> right it's just getting started yeah and um, you know some of these exercises you know they can seem I don't know, esoteric is the pol polite way to say it. They can seem that they might not have as much impact as they do um, for those listening out there. But I'm telling you guys, just be vulnerable with yourself. Do it. Mm -hmm. Put the work in. You'll feel what I'm talking about when you actually execute things like the letters to yourself addressing those who you resent from your past. And sometimes you might have to write a letter to the version of yourself that was uh, involved in all those shenanigans and, and forgive them as well, you know, for putting you in a position to ha have to go on the journey or, or thank them yeah. e either way, either way. But forgiveness is the antidote. And uh, we hope that you guys follow along in Lisa's journey and uh, are inspired by her journey and what she's going through. Hopefully you've learned to a couple things here that can help you take your focus on your journey to the next level. And uh, Lisa, what would one thing that you would want to leave our people with today that would be, you know, your uh, your best your best piece of advice to for somebody that was just talk to yourself, talk to the version of yourself that was maybe at the lowest of the low, and and what would you say to that version of Lisa? I would say you're worth it. Um, you're worth the work. Um, and I would say, you know, obviously I still have work to do, but my outlook on life is so much more positive than it was back then. And it's because of the uncomfortable, um, conversations, experiences that I'm putting myself through now to get me on the other side. So I would just tell people you're worth it. Don't give up on yourself. Um, don't accept mediocre. Don't accept that this is just how it is and it can't get better. It's beautiful. Thank you. And I appreciate you being here as a step toward um, confidence building. Mm -hmm. And we always, just like in the gym with our weights, <laughs> we're always more mentally strong than we give ourselves credit for. Yeah. You always can pick up the 30s if you're already doing the 25s. Mm -hmm. You always can. There's nobody that can lift the 25s that can't lift the 30s. So um, remember that you're stronger mentally than you think you are and, and, that, and that the journey that you can go on is, is worth it and you're worth it. So I love that. Thank you, Lisa, for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. We're going to take it out. Two claps on two. One, two. Yeah.